We've developed a conspiracy theory here that Scythe has agents crawling through our comments and leaving requests to review their coolers. And the reason that theory has developed is because we had a huge amount, this massive influx of people asking us to review specifically Scythe coolers like the Scythe Fuma 2, which is what we're reviewing today, at about the same time that Scythe started spamming our inbox asking us to review their coolers. So we're finally here. We've got the Scythe Fuma 2 in for review first. We have the, well, we've got a couple, actually almost their whole suite in for testing in the following week. So we'll be looking at more at Scythe coolers shortly. And this brings us back to air coolers. After a long time testing liquid coolers, specifically closed loops, like the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2, EKAIO, and all the other ones we've looked at in the past couple of months. Uh, so we return to air, and now it's time to review and benchmark the Scythe Fuma 2, including with our new pressure testing system. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So this is the Scythe Fuma 2. Again, we have a, a lot of liquid coolers from the last couple of months that we've tested, but we haven't looked at an air cooler since the Corsair A500 or Zalman CNPS 20X. Both of those are larger tower coolers. The Corsair A500 was originally a $100 cooler. Uh, this is a $60 cooler today the Fuma 2. So it's one of the cheapest coolers, CPU coolers we've looked at at all in recent, well, actually in about a year. And it is uh, only beaten in price by the Corsair A500, which I just said was $100. But following all the reviews of the A500, uh, most recently it was available for $27 on Newegg after a 70% price cut and some rebates. So that's where the A500 is today. But this is a $60 cooler that puts it alongside the NHU-14S from Noctua, which is in the range of $60 to $70. It is a single tower, 140 millimeter fan. This is sort of a dual tower, but they're both smaller. And it runs two fans, 120 millimeters in size, except one is half of the, it's a 15 mil depth instead of 25 mil depth, which is standard for a case fan. So this one right here would be your standard 25 mil depth. But the shorter one allows it to get butted up right up against dims so that the other side, uh, if you have dims on both sides of the socket, will sit above them or at least above the VRM heat sink or whatever uh, sort of rear I.O. covers you might have. Now this testing today uses our CPU testing methodology that we published in depth in 2020 and it also adds the new pressure testing that we uh, implemented for GPUs for the RTX 30 series but more recently for the Lian Li Galahad AIO and we'll put one of those images on the screen. But it's really interesting because it allows us to see the pressure distribution across the IHS to see if there's a potential uh, shortcoming of the cooler, a potential really obvious place it can be improved, or perhaps an explanation for why performance is particularly good or particularly bad, depending on what cooler we're talking about. So this will be the second time we're implementing it on a CPU cooler at all. The first was the Galahad, the second is the Fuma 2. And before that, it was just GPU. So we're still building that data set. But as we iterate with more CPU cooler reviews, uh, we're going to be keeping this as a standardized part, an addendum to our testing methodology. OK, enough of that. Let's get into the marketing details, the construction, the installation, and thermals and noise, of course, along with noise normalized thermals. We'll have timestamps below if you'd like to jump around because uh, we respect your, your time. Just make sure you understand the testing if you're doing that. And uh, then check back for the conclusion. This section is dedicated to the product's marketing. We always take this into account for two primary reasons. The first is to verify that the claims are realistic and accurate and that we test any claims made pertaining to performance. And the second is to determine for what the company claims the product is designed so that we can make sure we represent it in a way that's fair to its marketing. Scythe has multiple websites, confusingly, each using a different TLD for different regions rather than combining them under a single top-level domain. The scythe-eu.com page is terrible and limited information, but appears to have been abandoned by the company, so we'll ignore it. The scytheus.com page looks to be actively updated, though. The Fuma 2 page here claims that the cooler is, quote, designed with new concept and inspiration. 
The source of this claim, it seems, is the combination of a reverse direction fan with a standard but half-width fan on the other side. Scythe claims that the Fuma 2, quote, offers up to 15% cooling performance than the previous version, obviously missing the determiner of probably more and not less, but we get the point. The, quote, cooling performance phrase is not identified in any particular way. Scythe highlights that a third fan could be added, but in our experience testing additional fans on Noctua and deep cool coolers in the past, we've found that they often have almost no benefit. It doesn't hurt to support the capability because it's not like you're paying more for it uh, unless you buy an extra fan. Scythe points out that the cooler is 155 millimeters tall, which it accurately states allows compatibility with most popular cases. Some cases are limited to 150, so just be careful to check compatibility before you buy both of them. There's refreshingly little marketing on this page, actually. It doesn't make any claims about biomimetics or other made-up buzzwords, so we can appreciate Scythe's simplicity of marketing and applaud the company for not inventing buzzwords where they don't need to exist for an old concept of cooling a CPU. Mechanically, the cooler is pretty simple, but it's well thought out. The cooler is intended to be installed with the skinnier tower toward the memory. Memory clearance is thin here. But to improve compatibility, a skinny fan is used to enable clearance between the cooler and the first dim slot. Skinnier fans are less effective in their cooling, but useful in deployments like this. The back of the cooler is elevated in order to clear VRM heatsinks or dims on the other side of the socket if you have an HEDT platform. It'd clear any VRM heatsink we've ever seen, so there's plenty of room. Technically, you could run this in reverse if desired. The height would be enough to clear most RAM as well, but your fans would be unconventional in that scenario and you might need to get creative. The rear of the heatsink is roughly 60 millimeters deep and it has a 55 millimeter clearance from the motherboard surface, the rear being the side towards the VRM heatsink here. The cold plate is about 38 millimeters across with 31 millimeters of distance from the cold plate to the front of the skinny fan. The total height is 154.5 millimeters, plus or minus a bit for variance. The smaller fan is 15 millimeters thick, with the larger fan sized at the standard 25 millimeters thick. Both are 120 millimeter sized fans. The cold plate surface shows clear machining marks with a center that's taller than the rest of the surface, so this is an area of improvement for Scythe. This will show up in our chemical pressure testing and 3D mapping of the surface later, so we'll talk about that more soon. This section will talk about the installation procedure for both AMD and Intel platforms. Scythe includes a PH2 long rod screwdriver to clear the fin stack. Because one fan is reduced thickness for RAM clearance, Scythe also includes a bonus metal clip in the event a larger fan is used in the front or if you decide to add that third fan. This we think is a thoughtful addition and it's not one that's going to increase the cost of the product because you're talking pennies for these. The mounting hardware is all packaged in one bag and it isn't labeled for AMD or Intel platforms. There are pros and cons to this. The downside, obviously, is that it takes an extra few seconds to separate the hardware. Most other coolers pre-separate the hardware for each platform, so this is a small quality of life feature lost on the Fuma 2. The upside, we think, outweighs that downside. There's less plastic waste, and instead the user does an extra few seconds of work in order to reduce the quantity of single-use plastic bags. In our world of consumerism, Sadly, most people would only see the negative here, but we're fans of the simplified packaging to reduce unnecessary waste. And honestly, it's probably better for the consumer anyway because it'll force them to read the instructions instead of assuming they know how to use it. Starting with AM4, there are 11 included pieces to install the cooler. The cooler uses the stock AMD backplate, which we're not counting in the hardware count, but there's nothing to hold the backplate fully captive. It'd be ideal to install this on a flat surface like a table so that you don't have to retain the backplate rather than installing it in the case. But if you must install it while the board is vertical, we'd recommend a temporary strip of tape on the back. Next, four standoffs are installed. The standoffs have a rubber and a non-rubber side, the latter of which has a wider hole to clear the AM4 backplate thread. The rubber goes against the bracket here, the metal bracket, and Scythe doesn't include any official guidance on which side should go against the motherboard in the documentation that we found, but since it has multiple websites, who knows? There might be some out there. It only fits one way though, so that doesn't matter. We just can't tell if it's a mistake or not, because a lot of the early guides showing Intel installation show the rubber against the motherboard. After this, though, two brackets sit on the standoffs, with the rubber side again contacting those brackets, and four screws go into the backplate. A crossbar is then installed atop the cold plate of the Fuma 2, and then the Fuma is mounted to the brackets. We had one concern here, 
Although there are spring tension screws, which should prevent over tightening to a point of damage, we felt uncomfortable with how much torque the springs allow. We found that leaving about one to two millimeters of threads still exposed provided enough mounting tension to fix the cooler without any side to side wiggle when tested by hand movement. In thermal testing, we also looked at this with a fully tensioned spring versus about a millimeter and a half of threads, and we found zero difference between spring tension at full and the reduced spring tension by this amount anyway. Don't go too loose, but if the cooler isn't moving when it's wiggled by hand, then it's fine. We found the force to be uncomfortably high when fully torqued it down. Installation is overall trivial and doesn't go as crazy as the CNPS 20X by Zalman in hardware requirements, so that's good. It's just the torque you need to be careful of. For Intel, the process is mostly the same. A backplate is provided with four thicker screws that pass through the backplate and the, the board, obviously. Rubber stoppers are used to retain those screws and hold them in place, and then standoffs are mounted on these, and the rest of the process is the same as AMD's. We're going to get into thermal and acoustic testing now. Our methodological choices are all public, and we have a fully detailed guide on our channel and website as to why we made the choices we did. If you don't know how the testing works or you have questions about why certain things are done the way they are, we ask that you please educate yourself with the methods before posting comments about them. You can find a link in the description below for both the article and the video version. Our 35 dBA on the 3950X at 200 watts test is first, which allows us to establish performance against higher class cooling solutions. This includes a lot of liquid coolers and is a high enough heat load to differentiate coolers. At lower heat loads, the coolers will collapse closer together with more limited room for scaling. 35 dBA at 20 inches is our standardized denoise level for cooler testing, as it allows us to test for efficiency with all variables controlled, rather than allowing the fans to blast at full speed and just overpower the other coolers. We take the noise measurement at 20 inches away from the front of the cooler. This is done with the stock fans from each cooler, so we don't change them, and as such, the Scythe Fuma 2 can't quite hit 35 dBA. It's at 34.4, which is close enough to not make a massive difference, but it does mean that it's below the threshold by 0.6 dBA. The fans aren't loud enough at this distance to hit our usual target, and speeding them up further isn't possible. So it's objectively quiet out of the box. Obviously, you can quiet any of the coolers to this point by lowering the fan speed manually, so it's not a a huge difference, but if you're looking for out of the box, don't touch it 100% performance, then this one is more of a balance uh, aiming for the quiet side. Let's look at the chart. The Scythe Fuma 2 runs at about 1170 RPM when averaging the two fan speeds. One fan is 100 RPM below the other, so that's the average between them. The result is a CPU load temperature of 59.9 degrees Celsius over ambient at 34.4 dBA. That's close to the limit for this 200 watt heat load when factoring in ambient. Uh, even an extra 0.6 dBA, though, wouldn't change the ranks much, but it might be enough to equal the Assassin 3. The NHD 15 runs at 58.6 degrees Celsius over ambient. The Zalman CNPS 20X is at 57.6, and the Assassin 3 is 58.9. To give an idea for consistency, we ran these tests on the Fuma 2 five times, including two full mounts, so three with the first mount and then two with the second one. That's more than most tests you'll find done online for coolers and required a few days of testing and validation to complete. The results were 60, 60.1, 59.7, 60, and 59.7 degrees Celsius over ambient. And of course, remember that all of these are averages of the uh, hundreds of cells over which the test is at steady state. So this is insanely consistent and a testament to the consistency of this particular methodology rework that we did in 2020. So we're very proud of the consistency that it has produced. It ends up better than the A500, which used to be $100. It's $30 now, perhaps in part thanks to our review and the reviews of some others out there, but it's otherwise similar to the other air coolers on the chart. Liquid coolers still outdo the Fuma 2. Given the $60 price point, the Fuma 2 is relatively competitive in performance with the other coolers on this chart. The next chart is for VRM thermals at 35 dBA. We do this to measure whether the cooler influences neighboring VRM MOSFET temperatures. Radiators are in a top mount equivalent position for this test, giving them an advantage that wouldn't exist if you were front mounting. Air coolers are standard here. The Scythe Fuma 2's first MOSFET temperature landed at 40.5 degrees Celsius over ambient. This puts it about equal to the EKAIO 240 and 360 when those are mounted next to the VRM heatsink. The NHD 15 ran at 37 degrees for this one, with other air coolers at 43 degrees and warmer. 
The A500 had the least air escaping to the VRM heatsink. That's not necessarily bad, and ultimately all of these temperatures are well within spec. So this isn't something to pay a ton of attention to anyway. We mostly did this originally to verify the liquid freezer's included fan and make sure it actually did something, and it clearly does. The 100% test on our 200 watt heat load uses the same data we just saw. The Scythe Fuma 2 was already at 100% speeds for the noise normalized test, since it lands conveniently just below our noise normalized threshold when stock. But other coolers have some headroom not afforded to the Fuma 2. You can see the noise level next to each cooler on this chart. The Fuma 2 runs at 59.9 degrees Celsius over ambient here and has no room to improve without a fan swap. The NHD15 runs about 10 dBA louder, a significant jump for a logarithmic measurement, and ends up 4 degrees cooler. The 51.1 dBA A500 proves its supreme inefficiency by hardly moving the needle, while the 46 dBA CNPS20X is within error of the NHD15 while also running 2 dBA louder. The same goes for the Assassin 3. The most efficient number on this chart is the Liquid Freezer 2 360 at 49.6 degrees Celsius over ambient, as measured against a 43.2 dBA. Compare that to the 51 of the A500, and it's clear again why the A500 is now $30 instead of $100. This chart shows a weak point for the Fuma 2 that contrasts its previous strong point. It has no room to scale. So if you do have to soak a higher heat load or you want the headroom to burst to a higher RPM under extended or specific workloads, it's not present. You have no room to go up. This is also a weak point for anyone interested in more competitive overclocking, but that's a small market anyway, and you're likely already aware of those requirements. Cold plate flatness testing is next, tested from a known zero point and measured in microns of depth. The ideal measurement is one which has the quartiles rallied closely around the median, we don't want too many disparate spikes from the median. The Scythe Fuma 2 runs a range of about 3 to 7 microns depth from the known zero point, with spikes to 13 microns and 1 micron. These are the numbers that you, you want to keep as close as possible to that 3 to 7 range, and they're doing well here. Measurements were overall highly consistent. Uh, this is among the best we've seen, actually, with the Assassin 3 and the EKAIO 240 being among the other top scorers on this chart. The cold plate surface pressure test shows the pressure application across the surface of the IHS as applied by the combination of mounting hardware and the cold plate. To get a good reading here requires both a cold plate that conforms well to the surface, often present in smooth finish plates, and a mounting kit that evenly applies force. This isn't a height map of the literal height, it's a representation of the distribution of pressure, which is mostly determined by the mounting hardware. If we bring back our cold plate pressure measurement from the Lee and Lee Galahad review, you'll see that the pressure was unevenly applied on both of the CPUs by both of the Galahads we tested. That's because the Galahad tightens only on two sides of the IHS via the AMD clamps, but it does so in a way that lacks distribution of pressure. The Scythe cooler technically also has two points of contact to the brackets, except it more evenly distributes the load by the pressure from uh, the crossbar and by the tensioned screws. We did cold plate pressure tests with a hard mount and a soft mount. Our recommendation is to go with the aforementioned 1-ish to 1.5 millimeters of leftover threads, which would be positioned between these two mounting pressure tests. Now, ultimately, the uh, amount of threads, the length of the screw is going to vary a bit unit to unit, so just use good judgment and don't over tighten it. The soft mount is softer than we used in testing here, so uh, we were in between these two, but when we tested versus the hard mount with our middle ground test, the results were identical, hence the recommendation. Contact to the 3800X was nearly perfect. We've mostly tested GPUs thus far with this pressure testing, but compared against those, it's still one of the best contact patches we've seen. The 3800X light mount isn't terrible, and with pace it'd do okay, but it's obviously lacking and a middle ground would be better. The 3950X heavy mount isn't as good as the 3800X. This illustrates some differences in the IHS itself, uh, so obviously there's a, a sample limitation here. The mount is still good, just not as impressive, and overall the Fuma 2 has fairly even contact and mounting pressure against the entire IHS, and this is a contributor to its performance. Next is the AMD R73800X, shown at 35 dBA here. This reduces us from the 200 watt heat load to about 123 to 125 watts, and gets us closer to what most CPUs selling today require, including Intel and AMD alike. This also squashes the list of coolers closer together, so there's less range to be able to establish a gap between liquid and air coolers. 
In a sense, it's not fully valid for a cooler-only test because it'd be similar to restricting the GPU by the CPU when doing a GPU review. On the other hand, it helps provide a dose of reality for the majority of builders who leave their CPU stock and don't approach 200 watts. Note that these numbers though are not comparable to the 3950X results due to differences in testing and hardware, uh, even the IHS. The Scythuma 2 plotted 55 degrees Celsius here, putting it about equal to the NHD15, the Assassin 3, and even the Forlorn A500, as they're all within test variants. Performance is about one degree better than the NHU14S, priced at about $70 right now, and is significantly better than the NHU12S cooler. The gains versus the 14S, given the heatsink size, aren't impressive. But then again, neither are the NHD15 or the Liquid Freezer 280 gains in this chart. It's restricted by the heat load. And ultimately, the conclusion is that the FUMA 2 is fine for this. It's not technically the best, but it's about as close as you'll get at $60 from what we've tested so far. So for the price point, the performance is competitive, uh, particularly though on these lower heat loads where you're not doing any overclocking, and so you don't need as much room to scale with the heat as you would in a heavier workload. Finally, for time to max, we see the main advantage of liquid coolers. They can soak temperature change for longer. The time required to reach maximum or steady state temperature is longer on liquid coolers than with air coolers. So spikier workloads, like most games, will get extended boosting time with higher boosted frequencies with liquid coolers. The FUMA 2 ranked within error of the larger CNPS 20X. We think the effective contact patch and the air path assisted in its stronger ranking here. So that's it for the FUMA 2. It did relatively well overall. It depends on what you're talking about though. So uh, let's start with the downside because it's fairly easy to go over. The biggest potential downside is that there is absolutely zero additional headroom to improve your performance with the FUMA 2 if you are doing any sort of really heavy heat load, uh, by which we mean some level of overclocking, not necessarily competitive, but you just want to maintain a higher overclock, like a max overclock you can realistically support for uh, AVX workloads, blender rendering, uh, CPU encoding, things of that nature, H.264, H.265, transcode on a CPU, things of that nature, CPU streaming, anything like that, that's going to be a heavily CPU bound task or, pro or entirely CPU loaded task uh, with an overclock specifically. Once you get to the 125 watt range and of course below, the chart data condenses to a point where the range between the best cooler and the worst cooler is significantly smaller than at say 200 watts. And for perspective, you can check any of our CPU reviews, the power section to get an idea of where yours would fall. But most of the popular Ryzen CPUs right now would be in that 125 watt range, uh, if not below that. So 5600X, way below that. It's like 65 watts, you overclock it, you're maybe in the you're in, you're in the hundreds, depending on how good your overclock is and how tuned your volt, your V core is. But if you get something like 5900X, 3950X, uh, 3700X, those are all relatively close to the 125 watt test we do, close enough that you get the idea. And the idea is that the FUMA 2 at that range, when you're talking no overclock or at least not an overclock past that wattage, it is one of the best uh, values that we've tested in recent years. We do need to go back in time and pull out things like Hyper 212 at some point, stuff like that, stock coolers, but versus these liquid coolers and other high-end air coolers, the FUMA 2 did very well. It was limited in its headroom to handle the heavier overclock with a 3950X, and when you allow the other coolers to go to their max fan speed, then it really starts falling behind. So there's really no room to increase the performance on this thing. A lot of coolers, you can, you would ideally set a fan curve or a manual fan speed that is quieter, and then you give it a, a bursted fan speed for if you have that heavy workload for an extended period of time. There's no room here for this uh, to do that because it ships specifically with fans that are lower RPM and relatively quiet because of that low RPM. So this is good and bad. It's good because it's dead simple. You plug it in, you basically set them to 100% speed and you probably can't hear them over the other parts of your system or they contribute very little to the overall environment. The bad is obviously you just, you have more limited room to work with, but that's fine for a lot of people. So you just need to understand your use case. Uh, the cooler most impressively 
has one of the most even distributions of pressure we've ever seen. And that includes all the GPU testing we did recently. So uh, cooler to cooler, we've only looked at the Galahad for CPU coolers. That one, it had two points of contact, which this does too, as you can see here, except this uses a crossbar and it's also using a, uh, its own custom mounting hardware on top of the motherboard rather than clipping into the AMD clips that come with the motherboard. You get more pressure, you get uh, higher torque you can apply with those the springs on the screws. So it overall, and the cold plate's relatively flat actually, despite one point right in the middle that's, uh, that's sticking up a bit. But overall, you end up with a really even pressure distribution. So job well done to Scythe for its mounting hardware. That's mostly what that's a reflection of. And then when we look at the cold plate flatness test, job well done to Scythe for a very flat cold plate. So this isn't the best cooler we've ever reviewed. It's not the best air cooler we've ever reviewed or anything like that. And some of the hype is, is probably a little bit overblown on the Fuma 2, but it's still a good cooler. It's the best value we've looked at recently with our new testing methodology. That may change over time, but even if it does change objectively, it's still in a good position. So the Fuma 2 is one uh, that, I mean, if, if it seems like it fits your use case, you need a shorter tower cooler and uh, nothing too crazy in price, then the Fuma 2 seems like a, a good step in the middle of those really high-end air coolers and of the kind of garbage air coolers. So uh, it fills that gap well. And then if you want something higher performance, the liquid coolers, the CLCs and AOs, they're, they're pretty much unbeatable. Uh, when you start looking at time to max performance, ability to soak, the uh, performance efficiency, so when you're accounting for noise and temperature at a given noise level, they're hard to beat, but they also tend to cost 100 plus. So, and the liquid freezer two would be where we'd recommend you look for those. So uh, Fuma 2, overall, it's a, it's a good start for Scythe. We haven't worked with their stuff in a really long time other than a couple fans. Uh, first cooler that we've tested officially from Scythe and it's off to a good start. So thanks everyone for asking for us to review it. We'll come back with some more from Scythe. And in the meantime, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.